Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of announcements and reminders. First, reminder, please sign in up front if um, you have not already. Um, we also uh, have recently posted our Green Mountain Care Board agendas or schedule for May. Um, I will um, let you know we have two meetings that um, we don't have a board meeting scheduled at this time, but if we need to, we will. That's May 16th and May 23rd. On May 2nd, we're going to be hearing um, from our staff on the Green Mountain Care Board all pair implementation update. And then on May 9th, we're going to be hearing um, from Vital on their budget and their presentation. And then we have on May 30th a vital budget vote, which is a potential vote schedule. And then we'll also have a, a, I hope at that point, May 30th, the legislative session will be over and we can um, present to you a legislative update from this session. So again, this is posted on our website. Um, the other announcement and just update that I wanted to give to folks is last week we were up in St. Johnsbury um, for the day for our traveling board meeting. Um, I want to thank all the folks <coughs> in St. Johnsbury who taught us a lot about the great things that they're doing up there with um, their community. And um, we will be out on the road again soon. That is to be determined probably um, the fall, and we haven't decided our next community, but we really enjoyed getting out there and learning about um, the, the fine work they're doing up there. And with that, I, I guess I'll just close, and I want to thank um, both of our presenters today, because they're the folks presenting now from Mount Scutney are coming up from the southern or bottom part of the state. And then the FQHC folks are coming down from Burlington and taking time out of their day to, to give us uh, some finance updates on their institution. So I um, appreciate that and wanted to thank them. Thank you, Susan. Um, the next item on the agenda are the uh, minutes from uh, last week's meeting, the April 18th. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Well, I, I will second because you were not there. Well, I can second something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's been moved to uh, approve without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Let the record show that it was a four to zero vote. I abstained. Oh, three to zero. Because I wasn't there. Okay. So with that, Susan, would you like to introduce our guests? Sure. Um, so for our first presentation today, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have um, Dr. Joe Perez, the president and uh, CEO and CMO of Madison Gutney Hospital in Windsor, Vermont. Um, then we also have with him David Sandville, who is the chief financial officer for Madison Gutney Hospital and Health Center. And the purpose of both of our presentations today um, is to get into the Finance 101 of, for, for this um, presentation of a critical access hospital. And then um, we'll hear from the FQHCs next. Okay, great. Great. Thank you, Susan, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the rest of the board uh, for the opportunity to share some insights into the cost-based reimbursement implications on uh, Vermont's critical access hospitals. Uh, I have a few introductory remarks and then I'll hand it to my uh, right hand uh, man, uh, Dave Sandville, uh, to take it from there. Uh, I came to Mount Scutney five years ago, having spent my entire career in large academic medical centers. Despite being born in New Hampshire, I fled uh, to DC and then to Boston for a number of years. And all my experience was in uh, PPS hospitals and a DRG driven world. I uh, came up to DHMC in 2001, and while my role there was largely clinical, uh, I did serve as the medical director of care management at DHMC, focusing my time and 
and attention on uh, contracting issues with payers, utilization, review, uh, working with, basically doing the, the black bag job that no doctors ever want to do, but for some perverse uh, reason I, I enjoyed uh, uh, dealing with payers. Uh, it was clear upon my arrival at Nanascutney five years ago that there was an entire paradigm of hospital finance that I needed to digest. Um, after two years of kicking around Windsor and picking up snippets of cost reports and allowable costs, um, as well as, well, it's a DRG for this and not a DRG for this, it was clear that I needed more exposure. Um, thankfully, uh, David Sandville, our, our CFO at, at Mount Scutney, you know, bring, brought a wealth of experience, uh, both based in New Hampshire and in Vermont, and years of financial work at a number of Vermont hospitals, including CBMC and Gifford. So I've benefited greatly from working with Dave, and he serves as a resource uh, for some of the other CFOs in Vermont's hospitals as well, and, and New Hampshire for that matter. Uh, a few months ago, I sat down for an informal breakfast with Susan Barrett at Lou's uh, uh, in Hanover, which I highly encourage everyone to get to Lou's in Hanover for breakfast. Um, and we discussed the black box that CAH financing can be for providers, administrators, and the public. At that time, I offered to come up and discuss the model with the board. Really, I offered up Dave to come up and discuss the model with, with the board as he's the true content expert. Uh, so here we are. Uh, we'll focus broadly on CAH finance to start and then provide some real world examples of the cost report and some of the inflationary pressures on, on Mount Scutney Hospital and Health Center. I hope this can be an engaging discussion uh, for all, for board members, for members of the public in the audience. And, and folks calling in. And uh, with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Dave. So again, thank you uh, for allowing us to come up and share some information with you. Uh, I'm going to give uh, what I consider to be a fairly high level summary, of primarily cost reporting, uh, but it does speak to a lot of other issues as well. Um, I'm happy to go down into the weeds with you, but I know that you have an agenda. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions at any point in any slide uh, as you as the need arises. So that's my presentation. <laughs> it's easy. Is it on? Can you get the pointed at the? Yeah, the, I was kind of pointing at the laptop. I see the laptop. It's on. This is what works in my house. <laughs> it looks no. like it. No. Uh, I can just sit here. Okay, we've got some technical help. Otherwise, this can become like an Ollie North presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a light flashing. There's a light stuff flashing on, the battery, on it. So, is there something blocking? Them? How's your singing or dancing ability? <laughs> uh, actually, I sing fairly well. Who wants to see me dance? <laughs> there we go. Excellent, Connor. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, critical access hospitals, what are they? And, and again, there's you know, volumes of regulations and uh, standards relative to critical access hospitals, but the short story is in, in 1989, there was federal legislation written to protect the livelihood of uh, rural hospitals. And, and so uh, they have a, a series of standards that relate uh, to qualifying for this. One is your state must participate in the rural flexibility funding mechanisms. Uh, two, your hospital must be 35 miles away from the nearest other hospital. And uh, of course, uh, they have provide an exception on state by state uh, to have as little as 15 miles between facilities, depending on the terrain, the weather, and, and some other conditions. So our state applied for a waiver to get down to 25 miles away. Uh, and that was accepted by the federal government, and so uh, we, we qualify at Mount Scutney. There are conditions of participation uh, that guide whether you can participate or not, and, and the biggest one is you're only allowed to have 25 
beds uh, for acute and swing services. And swing is subacute. We'll use that uh, definition for the moment. And uh, you are allowed by statute to have one additional distinct part unit, uh, whether it's a, a, a inpatient rehabilitation unit, which is what we have, a, or a, a psychiatric unit. So you have 25 med surge beds for a simple definition, and you're allowed to have up to one other uh, designated unit with up to 10 beds. So in Mount Scotland, we have 25 med surge beds, which take care of acute and uh, uh, subacute patients. And then we have our 10 beds for the inpatient rehab unit. Um, we are audited and accredited by CMS through a contract with the state of Vermont. In other words, a lot of the PPS hospitals you'll, you'll see and talk to, you know, they have joint commission come in. We actually have the state of Vermont come in on behalf of CMS and they audit us against the uh, conditions of participation that we're required to maintain our, our, our CH status. And uh, we're, we're obligated to have 24-hour care. In other words, we, we must have an emergency room in order to be a CAH. We'll never find a CAH with no emergency room or the ability to provide care around the clock. Uh, we also have one other standard that makes us a little unique, and that is that our average length of stay for acute patients must be 96 hours or less. And so we can have a patient that stays five days, we can have a patient that stays two days, but at the end of the year, the average, when the uh, cost report is filed and, and they come out and do a field audit, is that we have an average of 96 hours or less. And, and that uh, has recently uh, manifested in a requirement that as soon as we determine a patient is not likely to be out within 96 hours from an acute status, uh, that uh, we begin looking at possibilities for transfer to someone like Dartmouth or, or another facility. And uh, so those are kind of the, the high level um, guidelines that drive who we are and what we do. Um, the purpose of the legislation was to, again, secure care in rural areas throughout America. And uh, I view, uh, I try to always find the simplest definition for everything, uh, which annoys my wife quite often. But uh, insurance policy is the best term I can use for a critical access hospital cost-based reimbursement. It's an insurance policy. If we get too busy, a volume goes up, uh, we never really fully enjoy uh, the upside of, of being super busy. Uh, also, we never really feel the full pain of not being so busy because the cost report is cost reimbursed on a per unit basis in its simplest form. So if you're busier, by definition, your fixed costs get divided up between more units and your units of cost go down. If you're slow, then more cost gets attributed to each unit and your costs go up and Medicare pays cost light basically. So uh, we never really make the margin we would uh, if we were a PPS hospital, we were busier than expected. And uh, we never feel the full pain of having an off-year volume life either. We do feel some pain and, and some happiness, but not to the extent that others would, would find or experience. At Mount Scotney, we also offer, in, in addition to acute inpatient rehab, acute med surge, and swing bed, we also have patients who are waiting for nursing home placements, and we have some respite services we provide here and there, but they are a small single-digit percentage of our census. As far as Mount Scotney itself, we're about 2% of the Vermont hospital system budget. Uh, about 30% of our business comes from across the river. And uh, we are involved with not only all of the Vermont Medicaid and exchange programs, but also uh, most of the, all of the New Hampshire Medicaid and most of the exchange programs there. So uh, whatever we have to know to operate here in Vermont, that's essentially double uh, because we're also having to be aware of what's going on in New Hampshire. Uh, we are a member of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Obligated Group. Uh, we are an affiliate and essentially we're wholly owned by, by Dartmouth-Hitchcock. We uh, are the number one recipient of transfers uh, for acute rehab, swing bed, and, and some acute. Uh, we take over 500 admissions a year just from Dartmouth. Uh, primarily, we focus on swing and rehab on an inpatient basis and uh, community care on an outpatient basis. 
We are the leader, uh, I believe, the leader of all integration efforts at Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. So everything that they want to do to better integrate with their affiliates, uh, generally we're ahead of the curve on that one. Whether it's uh, group purchasing, uh, whether it's uh, financial application, whether it's uh, clinical integration, we're, we're the ones. And to be frank with you, Joe, having come from there and knowing many of the players there is a huge benefit for us getting through a lot of those processes. Uh, and we are the only hospital member of the Dartmouth Hitchcock Health System uh, across the river. So we, that causes some unique rubs uh, within uh, the overall system because things are different for us. I want to talk a little bit about where funding comes from for us. So um, the large blue slice of pie uh, is net patient service revenue. So that is what we actually get paid for taking care of patients. Uh, when I did this presentation for One Care Vermont, or parts of this presentation for One Care Vermont a few years ago, that 85 was 88 or 89. And uh, as I think we uh, testified in our uh, budget hearing last year, the net patient service revenue pie is shrinking as a percentage. And so we've had some relief over recent years with the meaningful use funding coming from both the Medicaid and primarily the Medicare uh, program. But because we've run through our first several years on our EMR, uh, that's a diminishing return over time and will no longer subsidize operations and operating expenses. Uh, we also have tried to maximize the opportunity with 340B, uh, which also hits above the line uh, because that is uh, allowing us to be able to provide the care that we provide to our community. And you'll see the other one is grant revenue is a small slice, other operating revenue, which includes 340B, cafeteria, some rental uh, um, revenues that we have, contributions, <coughs> donations, investment income, non-operating gains and losses. That's what contributes to our, our, our uh, uh, livelihood. Um, just to roll on through this one, um, we're within uh, a patient care world. Where does our, our money come from? On the acute and swing bed units, 75% of our, our revenue are associated with Medicare patients. 15% uh, are Medicaid. Commercial is 9% and, and self-pay is, is essentially 1%. When you move over to inpatient rehab, uh, that number for Medicare diminishes a bit and it goes down to 66% and 9% uh, uh, for Medicaid and 25% for commercial. In outpatient, you see the pie for Medicare shrinks even more down to 54%. And, and the reason we're showing this slide is, is that later we're gonna talk a little bit about how cost uh, reporting actually manifests itself onto the bottom line. And you can see when we talk about aging population, that's, that's what we're talking about with Medicare that we see a, a, a three quarters of our business on the inpatient side is associated with Medicare. And as we move to uh, less intensive services, that, that percentage diminishes. So uh, number one myth about CAHs is CAHs are cost reimbursed, so they're all, they always cover their costs. And, and I just want to spend a minute or two talking about that. Um, but first, I have set this little grid uh, that kind of helps us kind of walk through how we get paid uh, by uh, some large payer groups. And for acute services, the first row, um, we get what I call cost light. So just because um, our accounts payable check uh, 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 um, clerk writes a check for a particular service um, doesn't mean that that expense is going to be considered an allowed expense for Medicare. Uh, an overwhelming majority of our expenses are accepted by Medicare, well over 90%. However, there are things that they find uh, unallowable. Uh, sometimes if we were to leverage the investment market and the treasury market for uh, some uh, funding and, and some loans, if they find in their determination that, th that those interest costs are unnecessary to how we operate, uh, they will disallow interest costs. They will disallow certain supplies. They will disallow any expense associated with a non-covered service. So there, there is actually a fair amount of wrangling that goes on with our cost report to make sure we're uh, getting all of our allowed expenses in and, and wanting to not get audited by 
having issues of not allowed costs within the cost report. So when people say, well, you get your cost, we don't actually get our cost, we get costs light. Uh, for Medicare, uh, acute, you know, we receive a per diem based on cost. Medicaid, we get a DRG, and that's both from New Hampshire and Vermont. And for commercial, most of our uh, acute business is paid on a percent of charge, and there's some ancillaries uh, that are uh, paid on a fee schedule basis. For swing, and I put slash sniff, so skilled level of care, as opposed to intermediate level of care, like uh, you see nursing homes offer mostly ICF and some sniff. Um, sticking to the sniff, which is a, uh, a significant amount of nursing effort, um, again, we get costs light paid on a per diem from Medicare. Uh, Medicaid uh, really pays us about $240 a day on something that costs us over $800 a day, and uh, that we don't always get paid. Uh, commercial, also, if we have a, a contract negotiated for those services, will pay us a percent of charges as well. Rehab is paid on a CMG, which is the rehab version of a <coughs> DRG. So if a patient comes in with certain demographic uh, scoring, certain clinical scoring, they translate that and say that's worth $14,000, we don't care what you do. So uh, whether we have them there for 10 days or 30 days, we get that $14,000. Um, and, uh, and that's from Medicare. Uh, we get a DRG from Medicaid, which essentially works the same way. Um, this is what's wrong with the patient. This is uh, the patient demographic, and uh, we're going to give you $14,000 and uh, take care of them until they're done. Uh, and then uh, commercial, again, is a percent of charge. On an outpatient world, so outpatient lab, outpatient radiology, outpatient uh, general surgery or surgery, uh, we're, again, paid cost life from Medicare. We get an APC from uh, both Vermont and New Hampshire Medicaid, and we get a percentage charge and or some fee schedule work. So uh, some of our ancillary services, radiology, laboratory, things like that, uh, some of those contracts with payers are on a fixed amount per CPT. So uh, one, one thing you should know is that we're a non-acronym board. <laughs> okay, well, I apologize for so that. So far, we've, we've had to figure out what COP is, what loss is, what a DHOG is. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so you, you got to tell us. <laughs> I, 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 I've kind of rolled through that, and I apologize. So, so uh, COP is uh, Conditions of Participation, our accreditation standards. Uh, DHOG is a Dartmouth Hitchcock Obligated Group, so it's, it's the wholly owned entities that share liability and, and resources. Uh, a DRG is, is how inpatients are paid for many payers, and specifically for your PPS hospitals, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, and is a prospective payment system, PPS. Uh, where they give you a prospective payment and then they call it good. So I'm not really sure how prospective that really is, but that was the intent many years ago. Uh, from physician and professional billing, uh, that's pretty much all fee schedule driven. So it doesn't matter what we charge, we get paid X amount from a certain payer for that certain CPT. So what was the APC? APC is, uh, boy, it's been years actually since I, uh, uh, ambulatory payment class. Okay. So an outpatient service, it's at a CPT level you get paid. So if you run uh, an x-ray 72140 CPT, they give you 110 bucks every time you do that. So on the swing line, mm -hmm. under Medicare, mm -hmm. um, the supplemental, though, will only go 21 days, right? The supplemental... You're saying costs light, but once somebody is, is past that 21-day uh, period... They, they don't pay anything that's no longer medically necessary. Right. So if we kept somebody beyond uh, a, a skilled level of care that is no longer medically necessary, they don't pay us a penny. Okay? Up to that point, there is no specific number of days associated. We have swing patients who come in for three days, we have swing patients who, who go to 100 days, depending on their condition and the treatment plan. So they may determine it's not medically necessary, but if there isn't a nursing home willing to take that uh, person? So uh, great question. They stay with us. Is it all free care? Uh, it's, it's close to it. 
the state of Vermont did uh, enact something in the Medicaid program that uh, if you have not applied for long-term Medicaid coverage, i.e. nursing home coverage, um, they will uh, uh, honor that for 30 days while you go through the application process as a patient, which we assist them with. And so we'll get paid for those first 30 days that they're no longer covered by Medicare and their level of care is below skilled. And, uh, and, and so we really push to get that through in 30 days. And, and to be frank, the state of Vermont has greatly improved their turnaround on those applications. So for the most part, that works out pretty well for all involved. Uh, and then uh, we work to get them placed to a nursing home. I also think it's probably worthy uh, of mention is that many of the nursing homes now are reducing the percentages of census associated with Medicaid. So we are going to be seeing a backup. Uh, we have seen some, and, and some patients are just difficult to place because of their clinical needs. Uh, but uh, we, there is fewer and fewer beds available. There are fewer and fewer beds available for uh, Medicaid patients as time goes on. We had, we had uh, in 2016 and 17 had uh, two patients that each spent uh, well over 500 days in the hospital. Their, their medical problems had, had uh, largely resolved, but significant uh, mental health issues and, um, and lack of social supports led to no nursing home. And, uh, North and Connecticut, but until we take out of these guys. And, and eventually, we did, were able to discharge one, and another gentleman died a, a natural death in the hospital uh, where he had spent the last year and a half of his life. So it, it was taken right. We're, we're seeing this now. Those are good questions, and I, I think they, they are system issues. Um, moving to the next slide. Uh, Revenue source by reimbursement type. So this is kind of how do we get paid? Well, 42% of our total business is covered in cost. 13% is, is essentially uh, on a fixed schedule. And when you really think about it, about uh, 50, 55% of our business is Medicare and Medicaid, which pays us less than cost. So I'll kind of segue back to the prior slide that CAH is always get paid cost or better um, is actually uh, not true. So since, since that uh, really kind of re recaps what you did several slides back as far as your revenue stream by payer, mm -hmm. one of the questions that Maureen sent me since she couldn't be here today is whether or not you could um, provide us with a breakdown of the operations contributions from each of those payers because you could, you could uh, have identical revenue from multiple sources but depending on how that uh, feeds through. So um, you could be doing a lot less work for one piece of that revenue. So we're curious, you know, basically this gets into the cost shift and other things. Yes, it does. So maybe I'll go I'll jump to the next slide. So um, I did this overly simple, but uh, somewhat illustrative uh, example yesterday uh, to kind of maybe speak to that point a bit. And I don't know at what level she would like to talk about contribution to operations by line of business, by department. I'm not really sure, but I think Yeah, see, what we don't see on here is your margin for each of these. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to have the, the percentage of revenue, but if you're not showing what that, what that actually is bringing down to your bottom line, I, I believe that on a payer basis, we provide that already in our regular reporting to you. Um, I'm happy to go double check that, but I okay. believe uh, that you, that is viewable in our data submission to you folks right now. I'm happy to uh, illustrate that differently or better if that would be a benefit. Yeah, if you could just do a pie chart similar to um, the one that you did um, for revenue, mm -hmm. if you could do it, you know, take your total margin and break it out by payer. 
Yep, I think we can probably come reasonably close to that without killing ourselves. So, okay. Because um, I'm a finance guy, so I'm happy to spend like four days in my office with a spreadsheet <laughs> and make it super granular and super accurate, but sometimes that doesn't help the story. <laughs> yeah, we don't want you to exhaust resources doing this. We're just, no, if, it's if, for me. if it's simple, <laughs> go ahead and do it. <laughs> I don't have to talk to people. It's just a software recipe. That's really actually quite comfortable for me. Okay. Um, but I thank you for your concern. Uh, so uh, FY 2017, I just put this one example up that's, that's fairly, it's fairly accurate. And, and uh, as, a, as a percentage of, of gross revenue, what was Medicare, Medicaid, commercial, and self-pay? And what did we generate for total gross patient service revenue? And then what is our approximate reimbursement percentage on that gross revenue? Uh, and, and the resulting uh, net patient service revenue of forty-seven million three hundred eighty-two thousand, uh, and then I just kind of show. I just to illustrate something very quickly. I took the same data, so you've got this, the uh, the same gross total gross revenue to your earlier point, and and I just tweaked it so that Medicare went down per, by a percentage point, and commercial went up by a percentage point. You know, how does that change net revenue? Well, it, it, it increases our net revenue by $426,000. And the reason I put that out there is we can be just as busy this year as we were last year and do the same business. And if, no, if FTEs didn't change, inflation didn't happen, all of that stuff, uh, just by the nature of what somebody's covered with when they walk in the <coughs> door, uh, which obviously we can't control, uh, will swing money to our favor. Uh, and then on the next example, what I did is I, I took the original uh, uh, example and I said, well, what if we lose 1% in, in net return? And what does that mean? Well, that costs us about $650,000, again, for doing the same business. So if Medicare determines there's uh, another uh, unallowed cost or uh, we, have, we render the same care, but some of it's considered non-covered or not medically necessary or what have you, and we lower our net return rate from 54 to 53, it costs us about $650,000 to do the same business we did previously. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. And while you're talking about the uh, profit and loss, another question for Maureen was, um, does your P&L capture the allowable cost? And if it does, is the difference between the interim payment then managed through the balance sheet? Yes. So, and I'm going to talk about that. She has great questions because they match up with my slides. But, Perfect. Uh, but uh, all we, we, we record all expenses, and we don't categorize them as unallowed until we put the cost report together. So our P&L is all expenses. We don't have little, like, you know, in radiology, non-allowed non radiology supplies. And generally how Medicare does it is they do it by uh, proration and appropriating funds across across the hospital, the department, whatnot. And I think I'll speak a little bit to that in a minute or two. Um, so Medicare's uh, guiding principles for cost reports is uh, CH receives 101% of costs. And I know you're thinking, I thought you said you get costs light. Well, it's 101% of what they allow to be costs. But the sequestering that happened a few years ago took two percentage points off that, so now we get 99% of costs. Um, allowable costs, not actual costs, we've talked about that. And, and really they want to know the, the, the real definition of allowable costs, again, if I were to oversimplify it, is are, are the Medicare beneficiaries getting benefit of that expense? And if, if Medicare feels like they're not, then that's an unallowable cost. Uh, part A, benefits from Medicare are part of the cost report. Part B, services. So some physician services in certain settings, if we ran a DME clinic, which we don't, uh, those types of things, those would be carved out because they're paid on fee schedule and there is no settlement on cost. And then uh, just as an interesting uh, thing to consider because it'll be a little pertinent later in this presentation is we estimate that our fixed costs are about 87%. And uh, I'm, I'm going to take a little risk and say that uh, many PPS hospitals, uh, depending on their size and their structure and the services they provide, would run uh, two-thirds to uh, three-quarters uh, would be fixed expense. And the reason that's relevant 
And this is why the cost report based uh, reimbursement works for a critical access hospital is our N of patient care is very small. And in order to run an emergency room uh, 24 hours a day, um, I would be lying to you if I said we had a patient in every hour, every minute of every day in the emergency room. We have, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of about 30% downtime in that department. And that's probably far and away um, our, our least productive department on a patient unit basis. But the fact of the matter is, we need to have somebody sitting at that desk, we need to have a provider, we need to have a nurse 24 hours a day. And we do our best to staff according to uh, historical usage. Uh, we literally look at the time of day, the number of admissions, and where we should stack people, uh, weekends versus weekdays, nights versus mornings. And we do the best job we have, uh, we can do. We have lowered the FDEs in that department to the lowest common denominator to meet the standard. The reason this is relevant is when we talk about getting busier or less busy, 87% of our costs are fixed. So they don't change whether we're busy or we're not so busy. Uh, and so that's why the cost report is a benefit to the critical access hospital. If we did not have uh, such high fixed costs or did not have a cost report, it would be near impossible for us to recover um, you know, our expenses. When I was at Gifford, I was at Gifford and converted us to a critical access hospital in 2001, the, uh, the drawdown of federal funds due to critical access was worth about 1.4 or 1.5 million dollars. So that's 18 years ago. Um, I would estimate it now at Mount Scutney, and if your number was probably more like a million there if I were to guess. Um, now, if I look at Mount Scutney, uh, that drawdown is probably worth $2.5 million. So if we converted to a PPS hospital and we decided we wanted to operate at 30 beds and gave up our critical access hospital status, uh, it would probably cost us uh, $2.5 million right off the top. So it's a pretty significant program, and uh, which is why we spend a lot of time making sure we understand it. Uh, we don't want to put that at risk. It's, it's a huge benefit to the community and to the state. It does lower the cost shift significantly. Uh, I won't belabor this too, too long. Um, I think the only acronym on this is MD, and that means doctor. Um, but uh, what we do is we take all the expenses and we reclass any expenses to be in alignment of revenue. We have revenue departments across many different lines of business. So anybody who has an accounting background, revenue follows expense, expense follows revenue. Uh, that's what we're doing here. And uh, we pull in uh, what we call Part A costs, which are uh, MD time that is not associated with patient care, uh, being a CMO. For example, heading up the quality committee, things like that, where there's no patient care. Medicare allows us to carve that out and to put that into our overhead. Uh, we smush all of those together. That's a technical term, smush, uh, here. And then we take all of the indirect costs, like the CFO salary, the uh, human resource department, and those costs get spread, according to statistics, across all of the revenue producing departments in worksheet B. And then uh, all revenues are brought in with their reclasses, and we establish a cost to charge ratio. So how much did it cost, and how much did you, uh, did you charge? And a ratio was established for cost by department level and, and inpatient, outpatient, and at a facility level. And so that is the driver of cost. Now all of those things that are unallowed all get carved out right here. So they are not considered uh, when Medicare looks to see what is your cost as compared to charge ratio. And um, the next page here, uh, well, again, I won't belabor this, later, but um, this is a sample inpatient settlement sheet where all allowed uh, inpatient uh, costs are established here. And then they are, and that's divided by all inpatient days. So they come up with a per diem expense rate. That per diem expense rate is then applied against the number of Medicare days, 
we add in the allowed cost for the ancillary services for those patients, and we come up with a total cost of inpatient services. Uh, there's a gross up, which I won't take time to explain, but it relates to our swing bed unit and how that interacts because we have swing bed patients in the same area as inpatients. We don't say swing beds down that hallway and inpatients are down that hallway. We try to push them together because we, just for efficiency of nursing uh, assignments. And, uh, and then they take out all of the patients' uh, deductibles and co-pays, uh, establish the cost that we should have been paid by Medicare. Uh, they add in any uh, allowed expense for bad debts that we weren't paid by prior patients for Medicare patients. And they say, uh, and then they compare that against what we get paid all year. And we either owe them or they owe us, and we settle out. Um, and then we have the same calculation for swing and the same calculation for outpatient. So before, so before you start on this slide, yes. on the previous slide you had CCR? Yes, cost to charge ratio. Okay. Credence clear water remodel. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, um, that's really, they pay us all year at the rate they guess our costs are going to be at based on the prior year's cost report. <laughs> And, and then uh, we settle up, we, for a 9.30 year end, we settle up, uh, we send in our report on February 28th, and generally they try to give us an interim settlement in April or May, this year they were early, it came in in April, and uh, they established new rates from then on, uh, effective the first of the, the next month. And I'm gonna skip this, this is the same essential math, but, um, what we do at a critical access hospital is we, we have one of Dante's circles of hell, and, and that is uh, five months after year end, we file our cost report. Well, that's great, because you don't have to worry about it for a year now. Now, that's not how it works. We have to test out their interim rate adjustments, so when they give us our new rates for the year, we have to make sure that we agree that those rates are at least reasonably close. Otherwise, we're building a liability uh, or an overpayment that we have to reserve for immediately. And we work those reserves on a monthly basis. Uh, they give us a lump sum if they owed us money uh, or they've taken back money. And uh, we, we do multiple mini cost reports during the course of the year to make sure we are reserving appropriately on the balance sheet for what we expect to owe or what we expect to get paid later. Um, we do at least three a year. Uh, if I had more time, I would do four a year uh, because it just keeps us right. So when we close our books September 30th, we've done a cost report to determine if our reserve levels, liability uh, or, or receivable, have all been, are all reasonably close for the final filing in Fe on February 28th of the next year. So there is a constant uh, revision of our balance sheet entries and, and balances uh, throughout the year to make sure we're not taking risk. And all of those adjustments run through our third party liability account, which hits deductions from revenue on, your, on the P&L that you folks see from us. Any questions on that before I roll? I haven't seen anybody quite glazed over yet, so I'm glad you're enjoying this. Um, so again, this is our balance sheet management. We evaluate uh, continuously on open years, current years. Uh, generally, we run two to three years behind on final settlement uh, from Medicare. Uh, the audit process, most years is a desk review. We send them our work papers and they review them. They give us a list of questions. We answer them by email with some additional worksheets and they call it good. Uh, any adjustments that are found or made. Uh, this year, we're, we're blessed to have Medicare actually come on site, and they'll be doing not only this work, but they'll also be counting how many physical beds do we have in our med surge unit. Do you really have 25 or less? Uh, and uh, so Joe mentioned also inflation. Uh, we, we looked because, uh, as you both probably know, we're, we, we started our budget season. and. Uh, um, we looked at kind of a high level, these are our P&L line items that uh, we, we roll things up to internally to see how we're doing. And looking at uh, FY18 expenses year to date, 
And then looking at the, uh, this was through uh, February 28th, this data, um, we looked at uh, our group purchasing, um, we looked at wage studies, we got an initial look from our brokers on how benefits are gonna change, um, utilities, and, and these are what we're expecting for inflation factors uh, relative to FY19 budget. And they're, they're, this assumes uh, no change in FTE, no change in volume. Uh, it does uh, uh, calculate a raise of about 3%, uh, including market adjustments. Uh, we are looking at some very uh, uh, unfavorable workers' comp increases. Again, we have a very small N, so we had uh, two unfortunate cases uh, that are uh, lingering on our liability workers comp and it's going to result in approximately a 40 percent increase for us um, in fact while i'm here there's a we're meeting with the workers comp brokers uh, uh, back at the shop um, we're assuming very tight increases for traveler and, and staffing costs we do share staff with dartmouth not only mds and providers but also some managers and uh, um, so we we are looking at about a three percent three point five percent inflation uh, for next year as we continue to go through the budget process that may get fine-tuned and maybe we'll beat it down to three uh, But it's probably not going to change too far from that Well, you're on uh, that that's all we prepared <laughs> well, you, While you're on that slide mm -hmm. Explain the bullet that uh, assumes to pre depreciation hitting annual expectations so every year um, we and Mount of Scotty, uh, say this is what we're going to have for capital expenses. And uh, whether it's bricks and mortar or it's software or it's uh, uh, equipment for taking care of patients. And every year we, uh, we fall short of our goal for spending, which maybe from your perspective is super good. Um, from my perspective is a little bit concerning uh, because we are uh, we've had uh, historically less than favorable financial results for, say, call it the last 20 years. And it's only recently we're enjoying some level of, of success. And I'm always fearful that we are not staying as current as we need to stay uh, to maintain the quality of our work environment for our patients and our employees, whether that's equipment or, or facility needs. I, I really, I always get a little bit concerned with that. So what you're saying, if to tie it back to the previous slide, is that um, the bump, the 68,348 bump in depreciation that you're anticipating for this year, if you're having trouble meeting your 3.5% um, uh, target, then um, you would cut down on the additional investment in, in uh, capital-related items? That would be one area, yes. What would be the other areas you would look at? Well, I mean, we've, you know, it's kind of funny. I was looking, we're in the budget process, and, you know, we've looked historically at what we've done and have those things worked out or not. You know, because everybody has great cost savings ideas, but then you kind of get a year or two out and you realize they didn't work the way they were supposed to, or uh, maybe they put additional pressure on the system that you did not intend or expect, and you have to back off of those things. Uh, generally speaking, I, I mean, we have beat down our, our interest expense. Uh, we are on Dartmouth's uh, group purchasing. We're not going to get lower prices than we're getting through there. Um, we've uh, been very uh, true with the benefits we offer our folks and how we have structured uh, those benefits to make sure they get everything they need, uh, but that we're able to uh, put costs a bit on that. Uh, we are behind on labor uh, compared to the state, uh, our average wage. And so we, we have really, we're not, we're not living, you know, fat, dumb, and happy on any one of those line items. And we beat them down pretty aggressively every year uh, to try to stay competitive and to do what needs to be done for the organization as well as to meet the state expectations. So on the interest expense line where you have the approximately 76000 you've got the identical amount. Um, I assume you must be paying down on principal. Does that mean that you would be... I, I have a really, really good deal. And uh, Dartmouth was able to help us leverage that deal. I have uh, a, a fixed rate uh, for infinity at this point. 
which anybody would die for right now. And, uh, and so uh, we're, we're not gonna refinance. <laughs> so uh, we have no plans to do any additional financing. Uh, we may have a lease or two for a piece of equipment, but uh, nothing material. But, but does that mean that you're never paying down the principal, you're just paying interest? Uh, yes, we are. Okay. Point. And that was the term of the note. And uh, um, it's actually so beneficial, it's, it would be ridiculous to pay it down. Okay. And with interest rates expected to rise, that's probably a good position to be in. We are in a great position uh, in that regard. And, and again, that was something we were able to garner with our relationship with Dartmouth that we probably would not have been able to get based on our own personal expenditures. So you've talked about the expenses that you would look at to try to live within that inflationary target. Um, if after all that, your next move would be to shift to commercial payers, correct? That's uh, generally how it's going to work out if we are unable to meet uh, your expectation from a budget submission standpoint and the needs of our board of trustees and Dartmouth. I mean, we're, we're kind of juggling three sets of expectations. Um, you know, and, and that, that's great when everything's going well and everybody's thinking the same way. Uh, but we find ourselves this year going into the process saying, boy, we have some divergent uh, expectations uh, on our facility and we're not entirely sure how we're going to make everybody happy. So what's your trend line look like for that cost shift as far as a percentage of uh, shift? Well, uh, as of right now, it's too early in the budget for me to uh, project that. And, uh, but, <coughs> But going back over the last five years or so, I mean, are, is your cost shift staying stable or are you increasing your cost shift each year? Uh, we are increasing it, uh, what I would call classify as slightly. So, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to bend, uh, since I've been there, I've been there five years now, we're really trying to bend our pricing structure down into, we're a little bit of what we are, we're expensive on many issues and items, uh, but, um, We've been trying to bend that with our price increases, bend that down to get more into line with the market. Uh, and the advantage of being a hospital like we are, critical access hospital, high Medicare, Medicaid, for a lot of services, it doesn't matter what I charge because those are you know heavily utilized by people who pay me fixed payments. So when you're doing that analysis, you say you're expensive for what you're doing. What benchmarks are you using? Who are you comparing yourself to? Uh, we have um, uh, a piece of software that came with our EMR that gives us, with about a one-year lag, uh, national averages that come out of the Medicare gross charge MedPAR data. And, uh, and then we also benchmark against Act 53 and some other more local, regional. We do secret shoppers sometimes. <laughs> if we're looking at it, we have a patient complaint on a particular uh, uh, service, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check some websites, we'll make some phone calls and see you know, how, how legitimate is this? We can't always fix that, but it's good to know where you stand. Are there particular services that you really feel you're out of line on? Or? Yeah, we're actually a little bit low on inpatient. If you look at Act 53, we're actually uh, pretty decent on most inpatient services. Uh, outpatient, we struggle uh, because that's higher commercial. So historically, a lot of that got shifted. Uh, and that's, you know, no one got where they are in, in, in a day. Uh, this has been, you know, since uh, DRGs and whatnot were introduced in the 1960s, this has been an ongoing uh, slot. And uh, so we're trying to do our best to, uh, as we perform a little better, to uh, bend our price curve uh, and, and try to keep our ourselves competitive. Um, you know, I, the simple example I gave a patient the other day was if 50% of the people who walked into Walmart to buy a toaster could get half price or less, uh, the toaster would be a lot more expensive next year. And uh, it's no more complicated than that. Yep, okay. So um, one, one comment, and I think it's really the biggest bogey on the radar screen for critical access hospitals in Vermont, and that's how we reconcile our cost-based reimbursement with the all-payer model. We haven't been able to get a straight answer from CMS for at least two years now that we've been fishing in that pond. Um, and uh, I'm on the board of One Care too, and uh, have been trying to push some of our finance folks to also help answer that, that question. Um, 
right now the response from CMS is don't worry about it, it'll be fine. Just keep doing your cost report, it will be penalized based with fixed, post uh, fixed payments, uh, fixed monthly payments through one care. Um, as, as you all know, we're, we've got our toe in the water in Medicaid, uh, Vermont Medicaid next gen this year. Uh, I will be working to nudge our board uh, to agree to go to all, all three risk programs for 2019, um, but uh, we're, we're flying blind on what that will mean for our Medicare cost report. And I, I think anyone that tells you otherwise is, has, is, is making that up a whole lot. And what type of time interviews, intervals do you take an internal look, um, especially if utilization is declining, and saying, are we the right size? Do you do that annually or? The right size as far as the services that we're offering? Correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I would, I would say uh, from my perspective, daily, um, because we get a dashboard that comes desktop every day is how many patients have come through the clinics, how many patients. But there's got to be seasonality too. So Yes, there is. We spread our budget seasonally. And um, the interesting thing is that on the inpatient side, we, we have generally over the last several years budgeted, you know, 19 to 20 average daily census for med surge and eight for, for our rehab unit. And we're pretty much right on those. So we, we've nailed that. We don't have any variance. We may have a day or two in a month that's low or whatever, but generally that's right on. The emergency room has been fairly consistent over time. Uh, there, you know, and you've heard, so I won't go into it, but, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, providers who leave for whatever reason, and if they're the only one of their kind, which is pretty typical in a critical access hospital, it puts a lot of pressure on us, and all of a sudden now, boy, are we the right size in OR, radiology, lab, because we lost that provider and their associated volume. So um, we do look at it. We just had a meeting last week as part of our normal budget process where we sit a number of senior managers and key managers in a room and we look at our foundational volume assumptions. How are we doing in the clinic this year? How are we doing in inpatient? Are we meeting what we expected? Percentage of swing bed versus acute patients. We look at all of those things and arrive, we look at three years data and we try to arrive at assumptions that will drive the rest of the budget. And, uh, but the, I guess to answer your question directly, I literally look daily and if I see a trend that continues, then I grab the department head and we sit in the room and we figure it out. Um, I think we right-sized when Kevin Donovan was here and we made some pretty significant adjustments. We closed our, our, our uh, nursing home. Um, we decided what we wanted to be when we grew up and that is community-based care, swing bed services, uh, community-based inpatient and, and rehab as a regional facility, which it is. And, and those have pretty much held true. We, we haven't varied too far from that. And uh, the volume is a little bit lighter in the clinics than we would have liked the last few years uh, because of provider transition and whatnot. But the rest of the hospital seems to be where it needs to be size-wise. And I think it's a good question. So you, I think I heard the number 2.5 million would be what the loss to you would be if you lost the critical access designation. Correct. If, if I took that number and went against your gross revenue, would that percentage be similar to the other critical access hospitals in the state or is there a lot more intricacy that would have to be? Um, there is more intricacy, but I think uh, we could spend a lot of time on math and I, I don't think it's that bad a guess mainly because uh, the, one of the key drivers to that money coming in was uh, uh, physician uh, practices being owned by the hospital. And so since most of the smaller communities here, that's the model. That's the only model you're able to function because uh, uh, docs aren't interested in hanging their own shingle in many cases. Um, that would be, if they don't own as many uh, um, physician practices, that number would be less relevant. Okay, questions from the board. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. And I, oh, as always, I learn a ton when folks come in here and, and give us these deep dives. Um, 
so I have an economics background, so my world is, yours is spreadsheets, mine is incentives. So I think about incentives all the time. And I understand the motivation of critical access hospitals came about at a time when rural hospitals were closing and there was financial insolvency and the need to have access to care in these in particular rural areas. Um, and, but at the same time, um, and I understand, you know, you, you talk about cost light and the 99% reimbursement rate, but with a cost-based reimbursement, even if it's cost light based reimbursement, compared to a prospective payment system, it seems to me there's less incentive to be cost effective or cost efficient as if you're in a different kind of payment model. And in fact, there is research out there, so I, you know, the geek is coming out of me, but research out there that critical access hospitals are less cost efficient than similarly sized rural non-critical access hospitals. Um, and in fact, that the, the cost inefficiencies get worse over time. So if you look at one critical access hospital over time and you measure that, that it actually, you know, there's more cost inefficiencies over time. So I'm wondering how do we balance or think about the incentives weighing the need to make sure that we have, you know, access to health care in these rural areas with also, particularly as where we're moving to Vermont with the all-payer model, this need to be most cost effective, cost efficient, and really trying to make sure people are getting the right care at the right time. It's the least cost way. So how do I grapple with that? Those incentives. I think um, I think there's wide wide variation uh, just in the critical access hospitals in Vermont. Uh, Dave mentioned earlier. You know, we over the last five to six years, we figured for well, since just prior to the DH affiliation and the years following that we spent a lot of time figuring out what we were going to be um, as an institution. Um, we uh, we have a laser like focus on. Expense management. Uh, we look at our FTEs, full FTEs for the institution uh, every, every week, and the spotlight is shown on the senior leader responsible for his or her FTEs. Um, we don't have uh, orthopedics or neurosurgery or, or, or the other uh, service lines that other hospitals can use to cover up their wards. Mm -hmm. which that's really been the model of small hospital finance is recruit a few orthopedic surgeons and live high in the hog for a few years mm -hmm. until they get tired of taking call every other night and they leave and then your finances crater. I think you made a conscious effort to move away from that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, the chairman mentioned, you know, if we can't stay within, uh, you know, uh, stay within our, 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 our budget targets, we, can, we don't have a service to cut. We don't mm -hmm. want to say, well, we're going to have to let go this primary care doc. Mm -hmm. We're going to let go the 1.5 general surgeons that we have that manage our entire uh, surgical population in, in our end of, of Windsor County. Um, I think to get to your point, there are ways that many hospitals cover up their, their cost inefficiencies, and it's with those uh, high, low volume, high reimbursement service lines. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had that luxury. Um, you know, the hope is that any specialty service line that we get is with, we have central coordination with the Dr. Hitchcock to get a day of a surgeon or a day of an oncologist, because that's what the volume um, that we see, again, in our part of Windsor County would, would justify. Um, we gave up, uh, if you build it, they will come model for, mm -hmm. for volume in, in, in patient care because we burnt uh, too many times. Um, and uh, so I think that's, at least for Mount Scutney, yeah, we, we are unable to cover up our, our inefficient warts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, the story I tell in a little DH to, uh, talk yesterday was uh, someone went out on our, so we have a very small supply chain department, two, two and a half people, and they were out, and Dave had to unload some trucks, and uh, um, working the overnight shift on, on Saturday. My chief operating officer, you know, pushes wheelchairs around uh, with or without patients. Um, we're pretty lean, pretty flat, um, and again, we've had to be that way because we haven't had the luxury of uh, an orthopedic group or um, specifically in our neck of the woods, there's a neurology neurosurgery group that helps to keep the number of hospitals alive um, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in the Upper Valley, you know, and they, uh, they, they don't work with us. God knows what historical reasons before I got there. Um, and that's okay. I, I think it clarifies what we need to do mm -hmm. each day on expense management. And I love to tell those stories. We, uh, um, 
I, I, uh, I know the, the, the words that always get bandied about around budget season is where are you realizing efficiencies? And um, there actually was one more slide that for some reason did not get in the email that I, that I sent you I was yesterday. I know, that's right. We had an abrupt stop. Uh, part of our affiliation with the age is really to take advantage of the efficiencies gained by being part of a larger organization. Mm -hmm. So supply chain, lab services, radiology, pharmacy, uh, early in HR, five big aspects of, of some of our, if not fixed costs, but they're high costs that never really go away. Uh, we, we have realized some substantial savings uh, as part of the application. We've also experienced some, some bumps in, in the road too when we lose service lines or, or gain service lines. It's not all um, you know, sunshine and rainbows that being part of the age, but generally it's, uh, it has helped us. So in our printed version of the slide decks, we do have the two pages that you don't okay. have. We have <laughs> yeah, the inflation good. continued, and then we have your challenges page. But yeah. since you said you were finished, I figured we'd open it up to questions. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I do want to say one of the, so I, I, I've not seen what you have read, and, and by the way, I do some audio at some point. So I'm, <laughs> I know what it is, and I'm very, I'm very personally interested. But uh, that, that said, um, one of the things, and this is when I got to Gifford and, and started explaining this to people, they, they didn't get it. And, um, and I've gone through that same learning curve with much of uh, the management at, at Mount Scotton. But if you, if you say I have, I'm gonna cut $100,000 in expense that I had last year, okay? I don't care what it is, paper clips, people, benefits, it doesn't matter. If I cut 100,000, in theory, I'm only getting $50,000 worth of benefit on that cut because I'm losing Medicare cost mm -hmm. reimbursement, which I think somewhat proves your point. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. So people <laughs> like, well, I mean, I'm only getting half the gain right. for, for doing the right thing. Why would I do that? Um, but the, the, the other side of the coin is that you can unnecessarily inflate your expenses and not get the return also. Mm -hmm. And it all boils down to uh, whether you're a good manager and a conscientious human being or you're not, just like it is anywhere else in any other industry. And I was, I was showing Joe yesterday on a, a related subject that when I got there, um, they had 10.8 FTEs in the medical records department. We're currently operating at 5.2. We have better numbers, better results. Mm -hmm. uh, our quality is way up compared to where it was five or six years ago. And, and guess what I did? I said, I can cut these five FTEs in a graduated process over the next two years while educating the base folks that I need to do the job so that they're more competent and more efficient and will leverage the technology we just put in, we just spent $3 million on. And at the end of the day, you know, we cut hundreds of thousands of dollars from an overhead department with literally, uh, I would say no impact, but actually a better impact. We're doing a much better job today than we were five or six years ago. Um, I lost money on the cost report, yeah. but at the end of the day, I did the right thing, and, and now we don't even think about it. That's just the way we live. And so um, I, there's a company called AMS that does a lot of productivity studies for hospitals, healthcare mm -hmm. in New England primarily. And we did a study with them a couple of years ago, and I looked at it, read it, laughed, and threw it out. Because we were below them, you know, below uh, mm -hmm. staffing levels on virtually every single department. Uh, and they'd study every single department. And, and I was like, see, you know, but you could bring that to another hospital, and they may not have the same result. Right. At the end of the day, it boils down to how does management want to run? And, and I'm happier to pay fewer people to do better work and pay them a little extra than having a lot of people unhappy doing poor work. Mm -hmm. So, let me just—I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, but with a follow-up question. So, uh, and I appreciate that you would be willing to make those choices in spite of the fact that you would lose money on your cost report in doing so. 
I'm wondering what would be the metrics that you would use if you were, if we were to reverse seats here and you were to be sitting here and looking at hospital budgets? What are the metrics that we should be looking at as a board to identify the hospitals that are really cost effective? What what are this, those metrics to show cost efficiency? So, my problem when I come to hearings here. <laughs> Is, there we go. <laughs> yeah, my problem when I come to hearings here is, is uh, you, what you see is what you get with me, for better or for worse. Mike Davis, whenever he had something he couldn't figure out or wasn't sure he wanted to do the scratch and sniff on, he'd call me because he knew I would just tell him uh, what the deal was. Um, I come here as a CFO, a consumer, a taxpayer, a parent. I, I bring the whole, you get all my baggage. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, if you know, you said what are things you look at. Well, I, you know, um, I think you spend a lot of time looking at things you either can't change, mm -hmm. we can't change. Um, I think there are some specific areas that I would look at. Productivity would be clearly one of them. I don't think the submission that we provide you folks um, speaks to that. It's too high level. Yeah. I don't think hospitals have the bandwidth, uh, even UVM doesn't have the bandwidth to do a productivity study every year for you folks. Um, so I think therein lies the problem. Um, you know, the only department that works for me directly, I have clinical and financial departments that report to me. The only department that I did not carve FTEs out of in five years is the accounting department because our reporting's gone up. Mm -hmm. Our reporting requirements have gone up, and they've gone from six to 5.8 FTEs over five years. And, and so my, most of me says, well, I think there are some productivity things that could be looked at. They get really kludgy in a CAH mm -hmm. because of the low end. They're a little bit more relevant at UVM, but I don't think any of us have the bandwidth to take on another 30-day study, which mm -hmm. is really what would uh, the two that we have done since I have been at uh, Mount Escutney have been shut somebody down for, for a month to, to, to produce the data, validate the data, deal with the exceptions, figure out what the right answer is, and move on. Um, that's a big one, mm -hmm. and it's probably the best one, but I'm not sure any, any of us could walk out alive when it was all done. <laughs> I, I think we would just be exhausted. Um, I think there, there are opportunities but they would need to be statewide opportunities credentialing enrollment costs i mean things that have no value to a patient mm -hmm. uh, or to a consumer and are just things we're doing because we have to do um, and they don't nobody follows up nobody asks us we keep producing the report um, every every place i go to if you guys you guys look all about my age give or take and uh, if you're young well we got, we all knew who ccr was so <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. but you know my first thing i always inherited it every department every hospital i've worked at except for amount of scanning actually and uh, first thing i did was shut off all the green bar report i said print them just put them on the floor because I want to see if people are actually looking at these things and if they're actually doing anything and if they actually have any benefit. And anybody who didn't say I'm missing my green bar report in the 30 days would just stop producing it because it's just a waste of time and money and resources. And uh, um, so, you know, I think, I think you got to find five things to manage and manage them. Price might be one, productivity might be one. I, you know, I, I, I had a document that I kicked around for 10 years here and I found it unloaded it five years ago when I, when I went to, of uh, these are five things I would do if I were in charge of the world uh, relative to health care. Uh, Send I it over. <laughs> I had legislators come to my office and I spent two hours with them. I said, you can take 50 million out of the system like this and nobody would know, which is a good thing. Everybody would still get what they need and we'd get rid of the nonsense. So I can tell you spent time with uh, Joe Wooden. Yes. Some would say too much time. I spent 17 years of my life with him. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we'll open it up to the public. Is there, Dale. I'm just curious on the... You're going to have to speak loud, Dale, for them to hear you. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm looking to see what page it is. It's the one, the cost report continued 
allowable bad debt, 156000 to 93000 I was curious a little more on, can you explain to me what happened in terms of pain? Did something change and just because something changed in definition it went down or can you give it a little more explanation? Yeah, it, 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 in this particular, and these are actual real numbers from a prior year. Um, so it did go down from one year to the next. And basically what we do is we take total uh, deductibles and co-pays that were not paid by Medicare beneficiaries and any secondary insurance that they might have. And, uh, and then Medicare makes sure we use good due process to bill those to the patient. And if they've gone so long, then they, like, they allow that as a cost. Okay, and year to year, you know, some people uh, as like the, uh, the dual eligibles, so Medicare and Medicaid uh, folks, you know, as, as some of those programs have changed and covered more deductibles and co-pays for patients, those numbers go down. Likewise, as those programs might get cut, then those costs would go up. Can I do one quick follow-up? Sure. Since it did go down, did you also though feel that well, feel is kind of subjective, but uh, yeah, I guess I'm asking subjective. Um, do you think the quality of care was also something reflected in those patients that was helped in that way? Like the quality of care went up for them? So because they had better coverage, they received better or more services? Is that what you're saying? Doesn't have to be more services, was it a better outcome? I, I don't. I don't think I could. I could state that one way or the other. Um, I think our patient complaints and concerns has been very consistent year to year to year, regardless of finances. Um, but uh, um, and I usually do get involved in a lot of those complaints. If you send somebody a bill and they have any problem at all, they're very apt to call. I don't send them a bill. I might not hear from them, but I generally will hear from them if they have any issue at all, whether it's the doctor or the nurse or the amount of the billing. So uh, they're pretty consistent. The phones are pretty consistent with feedback. And so I don't have any sense that that has a, uh, any effect on, on the patient experience relative to care. And uh, I'll add to that, Dale. Um, as a, as a, a doc who, who sees patients, every encounter starts, we are, we are payer agnostic. I, 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 I don't dig into the EMR to see who's paying for what. That discussion does come up, though. It comes up, if it's often patient-driven, if uh, there's a recommendation for a CAT scan or an MRI, oftentimes these patients that are going to say, I, I've, got a, I've got a significant copay or co-insurance or out-of-pocket maximum. And then um, that does become part of the discussion on, on you know, what we do next. Um, but walking through the door, walking into the patient room, uh, it's, it's agnostic to start. It's hard to find out in our EMR. It's very complicated. I don't know if I could figure out if someone was on Medicaid and Medicare at a glance. It's mm -hmm. challenging. Which is, again, from a physician's perspective, I think is a good thing. Other questions? Ham. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just got a, a, com a comment and then a question. The comment is I've been to meetings like this since the middle 1980s. Sorry. And it's the first, uh, <laughs> this is one of the first presentations I've ever heard that touched on what I think is possibly the single most difficult problem that we have managing in healthcare in Vermont, and that is what you're calling the high cost, uh, low volume, sophisticated services that cover up the warts. Um, I think that if, the, uh, that if the, this board is able to get at that issue, that it will succeed admirably, and if, it, if not, not. Uh, thank you. I did, but my question is this. Uh, the, I'd like to just ask you whether if, if you didn't have this requirement um, as part of the critical access hospital uh, formula, that you had to have a 24-hour uh, ER, would you have a 24-hour ER given your proximity to Dartmouth and given also the problem that, uh, and given also the problem that even if if, you're, uh, if your, your ER is over, that uh, unless the, the problem is fairly minor, 
uh, if it's a, a serious problem, like a big car accident, so you're going to have to get to Dartmouth anyway. So I'm just questioning whether you, what you think about that, and I'd also wonder if you would have any idea what percentage of the ambulance runs that operate in your area go to you as over against Dartmouth, depending on what's in the ambulance. So uh, I'll start with the last point first. Uh, our local EMS group has a, has a few have a few conditions that are passed by. You can make this go straight to DH if there's a strong. Um, uh, uh, suspicion for an acute stroke if there's significant polytrauma from, say, uh, an accident on 91. Um, that said, one of my overnight shifts last summer, we had a guy come in with a severed leg on a motorcycle accident at 105. Uh, I was dealing with that. Maybe not the best idea for an internist. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but otherwise, ambulance companies bring to the closest available emergency room. Um, so we, we get uh, significant MIs, we get the less than catastrophic strokes, we get folks that are septic. And what we do is we, we triage them, we start the necessary care, and then if it's not something that we can turn around and ED, then we do just, we send them up to DH as a, 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 a very quick process. Um, but because we've had to keep our ER open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we had to invest in telehealth options. So if you're sick and come to our ED, you get wheeled into one of our, our uh, trauma rooms and you hit a red button and a big screen pops up and you have a, uh, uh, an emergency room doc and an emergency room nurse from DH to help with the management of that patient. Um, but we staff our emergency room with physician's assistants who, uh, who work in concert with the folks from DH. Uh, so again, to get back to what Dave was saying earlier, we, we, we've shaved cost as much as we can. Uh, we could double our ER cost by putting in uh, emergency room doctors 247. And I know that some critical access hospitals in Vermont have done that. But given our volume of 4,700 to 5,000 ER visits a year, the only way we keep that open is by staffing with PAs and having telehealth support. I've been an advocate for extending that to all of the affiliates within Dark Hitchcock as well, because I think that makes sense. I mean, it, it, a critical access hospital uh, should be able to get by with a well-trained, uh, ED-trained staff of, of PAs with telehealth backup, which is a lot, uh, uh, a lot more affordable than, than boarded docs. Uh, and uh, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think the, uh, the explosion of these uh, uh, high cost, high tech, high reimbursement uh, uh, procedures uh, and uh, you know, operating suites, uh, top to death the cost curve when, when those are happening out in the hinterlands. And that's part of our, our post DH affiliation life is um, we don't have ENT anymore. And we don't have orthopedics anymore. Um, we, we don't do any OBGYN. Um, we, we moved services to uh, to Dr. Fishcock. I, 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 I think it works because if you if you have those services, you also have to pay those physicians, <laughs> and they can't. Do, you, I can't keep a cardiologist busy. I can't keep a joint surgeon busy enough. Again, it'll cover up the warts for a few years, but eventually that tires and they move on, uh, and, and then uh, you're right back where you started. So as a follow-up to that question, when you mentioned the $2.5 million figure that um, you would lose, what is that net of things that you wouldn't have to do um, if you weren't a critical access hospital? No, that would just be the loss of critical access hospital. That would be same business as yesterday, no cost-based reimbursement. So say that uh, you were to lose your critical access status and you didn't have to do the things that were necessary to meet that status, what would the dollar figure then be? I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Um, but, you know, emergency room is a subsidy, if you want to think of it that way. Yep. Um, primary care is a subsidy. Um, most of the clinics are a subsidy. Um, inpatient is not a money maker. Uh, inpatient rehab is break even. 
Um, so you, you see it's a diminishing return very quickly. And, and, uh, and you know, again, we staff efficiently on inpatient because our census of 20 works for a four to one ratio, a five to one ratio, it divides nicely into 20. Um, and, uh, you know, so there are areas that we've been as efficient as we can be without putting patients at risk uh, or staff at risk for that matter. And um, if the numbers just happen to work out for us in a good way. That being said, you know, uh, it would be really hard for us to look at our, our cadre of services and say, well, here's two we don't need or two we shouldn't have. Uh, ER might be maybe the only one you could live to tell the story on. Um, there would be huge community disappointment, and I'm familiar with some other hospitals who have closed their ER, and it's never gone well, and some of them, in fact, have reopened. Uh, but uh, that's really the only obvious one that's not, you know, maybe we don't absolutely have to have that. Um, and the ACO, you know, a lot of the services being asked for there are subsidy-based services in order to provide the care expected. And, and that's a problem. That's a problem for all of us. Yep. Thanks. Other questions or comments from the public? Yes, Jeff. Uh, just really quickly, I wanted to say to the board that I had said we would get an American Hospital Association person to come do some of this presentation, and they declined to do that because they just don't testify in states, which I didn't realize was kind of a policy. So I think that uh, Dr. Paris and Dave did an outstanding job explaining it a complicated reimbursement apparatus. So I, I thank them for their presentation. Um, and I think they did an equally, if not better job than the AJ people have done. <laughs> I was free. <laughs> okay, with that, I don't see thank any you. other. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much. So Susan, do you want to yeah, introduce so, our next um, segment? Our next lesson in healthcare financing comes to us from the FQHC, the Federally Qualified Health Centers. We're going to hear from Georgia Meharis first, who is going to give us an introduction and an overview. And then we'll hear from Allison Caldera from um, the CEO of Community Health Centers of Burlington and Dave Simmons, her CFO from the Community Health Centers of Burlington. So. Thank you. Thank you for coming down from the room. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction and then turn it over to Allison and Dave to have the information you actually want here. Um, I just want to note that we sent over some additional slides that we're not going to put up that just some background information for you all. Um, and also, um, we view this as the start of a conversation. Um, so it's, it's a bit higher level than the previous conversation. But uh, similar to any CFO, Dave can go down any track you want, <laughs> any depth you want, um, either now or in the future. Um, and additionally, once Allison and Dave are done, I'm going to talk a little bit about a hybrid, which is an FQHC critical access hospital merged entity. So we have two in Vermont, and there's one in West Virginia. Um, but I think it's better to talk about that after we have this part of the conversation. Thanks. With that, I'll turn it over to Allison. Thank you very much. And I guess I'm supposed to want to see this. See if it works for me. <coughs> Connor? Yes. Point it to the laptop. Point it to that laptop in the corner. There we go. There we go. So this is the Community Health Center of Burlington. Um, we are a federally qualified health center. We serve 30,000 patients. We are the only federally qualified health center serving Chittenden and Southern Grand Island. And one of the things that I always think is interesting about the health center is how distinctive we are, richly distinctive, in a rural state. Uh, the health center is diverse. Uh, our main, at our main facility on, River, on Riverside Avenue, 18% of all the folks that walk in the door on any given day are limited English speaking. And that's pretty astonishing, I think, for, um, for such a state as Vermont. Uh, we are also the only health care for the homeless federal grantee in the state of Vermont. We received that federal funding in 1988 
and remain the only FQHC in the state of Vermont that holds that funding. Last year, probably about 1,500 people came through one of our eight doors and identified as being homeless or marginally housed. And as you'll see when we get a little bit further into the presentation that um, the needs of the homeless in the Burlington area inform our services. So that's one piece that really does distinguish us from the other FQHCs. Uh, the other piece that I think is always really important is that we serve 20, the Burlington area, Chittenden County, Southern Grand Isle County serve 25%, a quarter of the state's population. We are the backbone safety net FQHC for a quarter of the state's population. <coughs> I like to think that I am uniquely qualified to talk about not all four decades, <laughs> but a good number of them. And I think that one of the reasons that I really like to show this, um, this slide is to really tell you that I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a first-hand witness to the power of what can happen when a federally qualified health center gets, gets funded for the first time. This is ongoing, sustainable funding in the form of our grant, and I want you to think about this. When we first became a federally qualified health center in 1994, the grant that we got was $154,000 a year. Now it's over $3 million a year, and we have earned that through competitive grants over the years and through demonstrating the needs of our community and demonstrating our ability to deliver. So I think that um, the other piece that one thing I will say is mental health and substance abuse counseling. Uh, if you look at, we became integrated uh, around the third to fourth decade, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that, but that is also something that I think is uh, very unique to the health center. But this trajectory of growth that you see as an FQHC here is very typical. You start as a free clinic, and then you grow over the years, and you grow as an FQHC, but you grow to meet the needs of the community. As I said, that we are virtually distinctive as an FQHC, and I think a couple of things that but I think a couple, a couple of things that I'm going to just pick out here because I think that it, it again, as an FQHC, really shows how we respond to the needs of the community and some of the more um, robust programs that we have that we may not be too familiar with. I think the first and foremost is our access to psychiatry. At the health center, we have 2.5 FTEs of psychiatrists. They serve all ages. We have four psychiatric nurse practitioners. Our goal in the psychiatry program is access every day. And to meet that end, we have walk-in access for psychiatry every day. And I want you to think a little bit about that. I know that you've probably been hearing many things about lack of access for mental health in the Chittenden County area, but I want to be here to tell you um, that we certainly are creating access um, on a daily basis and I can tell you that people walk into the health center who uh, need a suicide plan, need a safety plan, and we are there to be able to support them and to be able to provide that help. No small thing. Uh, the other thing that I think is uh, quite different uh, in that I will say that all FQHCs are required to provide dental services. Uh, that's one of the services in our lengthy list of requirements as an FQHC. Our dental program is quite large and reflects the needs of the Medicaid population in Chittenden County. Uh, we have 7,000 dental patients. 7,000. 70% 7 of those folks are Medicaid enrolled and probably would have difficulty finding, particularly with adults, finding easy access to, a dental, uh, to dental care in our region. Uh, we also provide a school-based dental center that's just for low-income kids. Again, that's, a look, that's something that's met, that was built on the needs in the community. I can tell you, and when we started that clinic in 2004, I think there were a lot of us that were thinking, why, why do we need this? There was, it, it didn't seem that profound. And I can tell you, after that first year of pulling thousands of little teeth in the Burlington School District, 
uh, I think we all became converts. And now we have over 700 kids that are being seen in that school-based dental center. And the beauty of this program is that the kids come into school and if they are not connected to a dental home, if they are not receiving regular dental care, and if they are Medicaid enrolled and low income, they are the only kids that are allowed into our clinic. So if they are not receiving that care, they will be allowed into the clinic. And I think the fact that there's over 700 of those kids speaks uh, quite soundly to the need that we have there. So I thought that um, it might, we can talk a little bit about how these programs are funded, but I also think that it's important to talk about collaboration because that is a requirement of a community health center and of, of an FQHC. We are required to collaborate. Collaborate. We're required to be part of the community and be engaged and integrated with the community. A really good example of this, and I talked a little bit about our homeless program, is that the state of Vermont, uh, several years ago, in the Chittenden County area, was finding that, that they were providing motel vouchers for people who are homeless on cold nights. It's called the cold weather exception. And these costs were very high in the Chittenden County area. It was very clear that there needed to be, not only was this a poor investment in terms of ending homelessness and to bringing people into care and treatment, which is really ultimately what someone needs uh, who's living on, chronically homeless and living on the street. They needed to have a low barrier warming shelter and a, a place to stop so they could get in off the street, but more or less so they could also be connected to services. This is a better model. So the health center, and I can tell you five years ago, I never would have dreamed that I would be sitting here telling you that we would be uh, one of the emergency, larger emergency shelters in the city of Burlington. Well, during this last winter, we housed 38 to 42 people a night in our low barrier water shelter. And this makes economic sense. We are contracting with the state to deliver the service uh, from November 1st to April 16th. And they're looking at, this has been so successful, we're looking into a year-round uh, shelter. We have a new medical respite partnership with the Medical Center Hospital of Vermont. Uh, this has been a easy, simple intervention. And I'm sure that it's not something maybe you hear very often, the words easy and simple. Well, I'm here to tell you, this was easy and simple. The hospital knew that they had folks that were languishing in hospital beds, people that did not need to be in the hospital but could be discharged if they had a place to lay their head and a safe place to go. They came to the health center, they came to Champlain Housing Trust, and they asked us to staff 24-7 four medical <coughs> respite beds in a converted motel on Shelburne Road called the Bel Air. And we now have a services contract with them, and we provide 24-7 care. And we have four people right now that are in those beds that would have been in the hospital. We have folks that are chronically homeless that had no place to prepare for a colonoscopy. Think about that. You've ever had one? Think about what you need in order to be able to prepare for a colonoscopy. Simple, a bed and a bathroom people there to be able to take care of you, we can provide that. Um, I'll also tell you another, just a quick story is that we had an outbreak of flu in the warning shelter and we literally were able to um, put all these uh, processes in motion and move out the, the person who had the confirmed case of the flu and move them into medical respite. We had another gentleman who just walked into our Safe Harbor Health Center uh, the other day who, who looked like he was yellow from head to toe. Not unusual to see someone in uh, who's been avoiding care. And he came into the system, obviously with some sort of liver failure. We were able to put him in, stabilize him, and get him to medical respite, all without getting into the hospital. And for the cost of this, the contract between us and the hospital right now is $350,000 a year. Simple, cost effective. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Pretty good. It's what an FQHC can do. Um, the other thing, I will talk a minute just about psychiatry because um, 
one of the things that came to our attention about six or eight months ago was that the pediatricians in the community were facing long wait lists to get kids that they were caring for um, psychiatric consults. And since we were fortunate enough to be able to recruit a Harvard-trained uh, psychiatrist who uh, also provides care to all ages, uh, once she came on board, we started taking kids from that were not our patients, which is unusual for us, but we decided that the community need was so dire that that was some place that we should step up to the plate. That program is now, now happening and the kids are getting consult. And I understand it's working well. I'm happy to come back and give you an update on that when we're a little further down the road. We're also doing a pilot with VNA. Uh, Judy Peterson, who is the CEO of the VNA, the company, uh, asking about how we could get some psychiatric care into people who are homebound, uh, people with chronic persistent mental illness. Uh, her staff are feeling overwhelmed dealing with the complex needs of these patients. We're now sending a psychiatrist. Um, this is a community benefit program uh, funded by the community benefit uh, to the VNA, and they pay us. More, I, I can, we can stay tuned on that too. But again, simple, meeting the need. One of the things that I felt was really very important to talk about, and again, I can speak from firsthand experience to this, were the accountabilities and responsibilities and the compliance requirements of being an FQHC. Uh, as a person who used to do a lot of this regulatory reporting for the health center, it is demanding, it is robust, and it is never ending. We are required to write a grant. It becomes come every year. Um, every third year, we are requir required to do a complete community needs assessment, and basically, it is competitive. We can lose our grant. We haven't, and we won't, um, but it is competitive. So it's not something that you get the FQH status and you can rest on your laurels. Um, every, every in between the three-year cycle of your competitive grant, um, there is an in-person HRSA site team that comes on site. They audit your um, 19 program measures or your compliance manual, and I believe that Georgia has thoughtfully provided the compliance manual to you. And uh, believe me, they go through every everything that you do in excruciating detail, I guess is the way that I would put it. Um, as an example, the last time that we had an audit, uh, we had several action items that we needed to respond to, things like our sites that were listed um, in the electronic hand handbooks. We needed the sites were not correct, the nursing homes were listed. That was an action item and a compliance issue that they were not the right listing. So it is that there's a lot of attention to detail that I do not think that people are, are quite aware of. We have 16 required clinical, clinical quality measures that we must track, we must report, and we are benchmarked with other FQHCs in the state of Vermont and other FQHCs across the country. Um, the quality piece, uh, speaking of someone who's been part of an FQHC for a long time, is becoming much more demanding and much more rigorous, and we welcome that. Uh, we are really paying good attention to our reporting. We are checking the boxes. Uh, we are a patient-centered medical home, uh, level three at all of our sites. I think that um, studies show that FQHCs provide excellent quality care. Um, we are happy to be benchmarked to demonstrate this. The other thing that I think is important is to understand the role of the board and the oversight that our community majority board has. Yes, they need to be a majority of patients. Yes, they need to reflect the community. There are some other quirks in here too. For instance, there is a requirement that limits the number of folks who can sit on your board who get their income from healthcare. So we can't have a board of physicians. We have to have a board that represents real patients from our community. I think that's actually pretty remarkable when you consider how long this, this model has been in place. It's a, it's a grassroots look at how you assess community need. Our board 
actually has control of details. Like, when are your hours? If I want to change hours at my Pearl Street Youth Health Center where at-risk kids are able to access walk-in care, I just recently had to go to the board and explain why we need to change that, um, the hours from 10 to 5 to 10 to 6. They had to approve that. You know why? Because if we are changing things that may limit access in the community, they want to know about it, and they're in charge. And again, I think this is something that is um, part of the model that binds all the FQHCs that I think is really important in terms of what we're accountable for. So why? Well, I think um, one of the things that I can say, and I think I can say this as a multi, many generations, frugal, thrifty Vermonter, this saves money. This is proven, this is a model that I cannot tell you how many times that I have seen we have kept someone out of the hospital, that our hours make it easy for someone who can't take paid time off of work, can walk in to access and primary care. This is a investment that pays back. And Georgia, I think, has some, um, in the legislative day materials and other bi-state materials, has some studies that just recently came out. There was one of them, I believe it was the Journal of Public Health. Don't forget we're a major employer. The health center employs over 300 people at eight different sites. There isn't anyone in any one of our sites that earns under $15 an hour. That is a commitment that we make to our community. And the other piece is, is that we got our start in the old North End of Burlington, and uh, for those of you that are familiar with that area, it's one of the poorest areas in the state of Vermont. We now have a beautiful facility there, and we hire people from the neighborhood and people from all areas of Chittenden County. It's important. So I think I just wanted to say that we're designed to respond to and be part of the community. We drive change from patient experience. And we focus on reducing those barriers to care. That is something that I share in every FQHC model. And that is something that every FQHC in the state of Vermont is responsible for. So one of the things that I can tell you is that federal grants and expansion opportunities have been our lifeblood at the health center for um, certainly since the time that I've been there, which has been over 20 years. Uh, a way to grow your programs is through competitive grants and expansions. These are competitive. We compete not only in Vermont, but we compete across the country. Uh, in 2009, the Health Center was the recipient of a $10.9 million grant that allowed us to rebuild our building on Riverside Avenue from the ground up. That was one of the most competitive FQHC grants that I've ever been, I've ever participated in. I believe, by memory serves me, I think there were only 60 across the country, and there were something like six or 800 competitive applications. But we're competitive because of the needs that are demonstrated in Chittenden County. The diversity, the needs of the homeless, the lack of access to care, things like 7,000 dental patients that need access. We can make the case. And that's why our, our grant has grown from 154,000 to over uh, $3 million, million over those years. And I think that we're gonna speak to the Medicaid reimbursement. Um, one of the things that I will say is that we seem to do spend a lot of time talking about this, and I know that you and Dave will get into the exhaustive details about this, but one of the things I'd like to say is that it's a great value. And I think that, that again, that's demonstrated by the studies and demonstrated by the, by the robustness of our program. We are specialty primary care. Um, I like the way that Dave describes it. Um, and he can, I think he can speak to this very well, uh, being someone that had uh, worked for, uh, been part of the hospital system for many years, is that we are midway between typical primary care and hospital. We're required to take people who walk in an emergency. If I have someone walk in with an abscess in their tooth, well, we need to take care of them. We can't just send them away. This is part of our accountability. 
Uh, one of the things that maybe is not always common knowledge is the fact that we are, all of our employees at, at the Community Health Centers of Burlington, all of QHCs, are considered federal employees. Uh, at the health center, we have an OB and prenatal care program that cares for, let's say, about 160 medically underserved women. 70% of them are refugees. Uh, many of these are women that need access to support services that we provide. Um, you know, example, a woman that has uh, kids in foster care, someone who's coming out of our opiate addiction treatment program, someone who has complex mental health issues. It's important that we provide OB program. OB, mal OB malpractice insurance is extremely expensive. We are able to provide the service because we get FTCA malpractice insurance through the federal government. Do you know how that would compare to what others would be paying? Oh, is it, a, yeah, George is saying over $400,000 a year, and I think when the last time we looked into it, that, that seems about right. I can get you that number for sure, but it would be out of reach for us. And access to 340B, uh, again, Dave will speak it, it, it directly to what that means um, in terms of our closing the gaps that we have. Um, but we, we gave $3.3 million in savings from the 340B directly back to the patients in 2017. Is that 3.3 your total savings, or are you using some of the... That's uh, just to the patient. That's just what went to the patient. So you're using it as part of your revenue stream? Yes. Well, Dave, will, Dave will give you the numbers about that and go through that. But okay. This is, this is in savings to the patient. Imagine this, this is a patient that has no coverage and their Medicare recipient that's in the donor. This is someone that don't, does not have coverage for a particular um, prescription. This is someone who is uninsured or that lacks the prescription coverage. This is someone that was able to access uh, prescriptions through that program. When we asked for this number, I'll tell you, we were surprised. <clears throat> this is significant. <laughs> Now for, now for the good stuff. This <laughs> is right over to Dave. Yeah, I don't have fancy slides like Dave did, but uh, <laughs> well, basically what we do is show that 71% of our income does come from patient revenues. Um, of that mix, it's basically 36% is uh, Medicaid, 27% is Medicare, 34% is commercial insurance, and 34% is self pay or basically uninsured patients. For Medicaid, and, and about Dave, can I ask you the same question that we asked the uh, critical access hospital? Do you have um, information that would show what what that is for your margin at the center? In a sense, yes. Okay. And this, um, what we do is we look at our PPS rate. Our PPS rate was actually established by BIPA back in 1999. It was put into effect in 2002. Um, what we look at is how much that reimburses compared to our encounter rate. Everything that we do is based on an encounter rate. For the most part, labs are excluded from that, dental is excluded from that. From the medical side, the behavioral health side, it is all encounter rate based. What we look at is, we're using our cost report, we file, we look at what our cost is per providing each encounter, and we look at what we're getting for our PPS rate. So in this case, for Medicaid, we're getting about 84 cents for on every dollar that we spend in reimbursement for that. For on the, when, if you look at Medicare, we're getting about 80 cents on the dollar for reimbursement. And on the commercial insurances, we only get about 56 cents on the dollar for reimbursement. This is where all of our funding is coming from uh, as far as our patient income. And what that then does is says that really we don't get a bottom line or an operating margin of many of our payers this way. We take a loss on everything that we do. Uh, the self pay program, the 3%, uh, those, most of those are on the slide. Those are uninsured patients, are usually 200% of poverty or less, uh, or we just charge a nominal fee. So in that sense, no, we don't really have any margin that we're getting from this. So the question is, how do we get reimbursed or how do we get paid? How do you help me understand that commercial line? The commercial line? Yeah. We are just like, um, we get PPS for Medicare, we get Medi PPS for Medicaid, but on the commercial line, it's just like, as Dave Sample talked about, we get the fee schedule, the phys physician fee schedule. Those are set by the commercial insurances. Um, 
Sometimes they increase them, sometimes they don't. This year we haven't gotten any increases from any of the commercial insurances, so we are stuck with whatever they decide is going to be the basically what they're willing to pay us. And that's only about 56 cents on the dollar, but we cost us to provide that service. Do you know if you're getting the same reimbursements as others who are providing the same service? I can't say for sure because those are kept confidential, but my understanding is that they, I think they're all pretty common to the same rate. For Blue Cross especially. Okay. And, and, and one of the things that we have found over the past few year, two years is that our mix has changed tremendously uh, with a couple of new practices that have part, become part of the FQHC. Our Blue Cross, our commercial base is growing considerably and that's actually hurting us financially. It's nice to have a distributed to amongst different payers, but financially it is actually hindering us to some extent. Okay. So how we close the gap between the, uh, the 21% uh, or the 71% to 90%, 16% of it comes from our federal gr um, for grants. 12% of that is our federal grants. That's the three million that Allison spoke about. We have 2% on our uh, state grants. The state grants are primarily focused on specific programs. One of those would be the warming shelter, or we also have um, a PATH grant for our homeless program and that. So those are specific to certain types of pro programs that we provide. Private grants, those are mainly items um, um, like the UVM, uh, United Way, and those types of grants. Blueprint and MAP money for our opiate program and what we get for Blueprint is now 4% of our budget. 340B is now making up 8% of our budget. This is what's really helping us more than anything is the 340B program. The 8% is our share of what we're collecting on the 340B program, not what we're giving to the patients. So that's almost about $1.8 million. And that other is just kind of miscellaneous stuff that we have. Your 70-30 split between the grants and the uh, revenues from the, tr the traditional uh, streams, is that um, typical of all FQHCs or just yours? I think you will, well, each state uh, varies tremendously on what you see and what they are getting for reimbursement. I know that we have heard of some FQHCs that are relying on 40% of their income is coming from 340B. We also know that we have, there are other states that are paying above the cost of um, providing the care for the Medicaid program because they are looking more to pushing money into primary care to get it to expand. So I think it's all going to vary depending on where you find, what state you're in and where you're uh, located. But what about here in Vermont? Is it pretty typical? I think there may be some, and Georgia may speak to this too, but I think there's also some of the newer FQHCs and some of the smaller FQHCs have much greater reliance on the grant. Um, as well, is that, yeah, yeah that, that's correct. Um, it, frankly, the F3Cs who are newer um, and also coincidentally smaller in the state of Vermont, the federal grant that's 12% for community health centers in Burlington can go up to as much as 24% for them as part of their total. So the um, kind of growth trajectory that Allison laid out is important in terms of the overall reimbursement mix and how much their how many how big their patient load is, how fast they're able to grow to really balance the um, reimbursement compared to the other um, uh, programs and other funding sources they have. Are there rules that um, require you to um, provide a percentage of the 340B to the consumer versus just trying to use it as a revenue stream? No, um, the 340B program is governed by Congress, um, and HRSA mm -hmm. actually implements, um, and um, there are very few rules about how the funds can be spent other than they must be spent to the benefit of patients. Um, and there's some rules about what a patient is and how you qualify, and there's significant additional separate oversight yeah. for the 340B program um, that we'd be happy to come back and talk with you about, but it's, um, but when Dave talks about other states, 40%, um, 340B, is that because they're making the argument, they're, they're keeping all the 340B savings, but making the argument that um, the benefit to the consumer is through reduced prices in the operation of the FQHC by the FQHC retaining that revenue? Um, I, is that a legitimate reason? I, I would not say that that's a reason I have heard. It could be a reason. Um, for my understanding of those where the 340B program is a higher percentage of their overall 
operating revenue is because, for example, they don't have Medicaid expansion, so they don't have that revenue stream okay. coming in, so they need to offset it with something else. I don't know if you have heard something oh, different. Right. Yeah, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind as well is the health center, our, in speaking about CHCD, we do not have an on-site pharmacy. We are part of a pharmacy network with other FQHCs, and in talking with some of the other um, FQHCs across the country, I think that it, it, with those 40%, I think we might be talking about um, an FQHC that is the only pharmacy. And they have in-house pharmacies in their, in all of their FQHCs, so I think that may be part of the difference as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Actually, could you look back one slide? Sure. Um, the one thing I did want to point out, too, and again, looking at uh, how we get our payment in that, and it brought back good memories of when I was in the hospital listening to cost shifting and that, we have no ability to cost shift. Medicaid and Medicare, they go up by the Medicaid, Medicare Economic Index every year, so this year it's a 1.9% increase. Commercials have decided, you know, whether we get an increase or not, this year it's a zero. So effectively, we've got a 1.2% increase on revenues that we have from the patient income. We don't have anywhere we can cost shift. We can't adjust rates. We can't do things that will cause us additional funding. And that's where we have a very big difference, and that's where we have to struggle with it. So I can move on there. Okay. Um, so anyways, this is where we, uh, you know, this is where we have to rely on the 340Bs, or that are coming in. When you look at inflation and things like that, what we pay our, our staff for that, it's limited. We look at what we can generate based on these types of increases and say, how can we afford to do that? This is where we vary considerably from what hospitals do. So I think that the other thing that I, I'm not sure that, that people, uh, that, that you maybe hear too much about in terms of the FQHCs, but community support is really important to the health center. Uh, when I talked about the building that we got the grant for, we raised $700,000 to complete that building. Uh, and that was, that's a huge support to the health center. Um, not to have, uh, a, to have a building that's completely paid for was really important to us. This is, this, this is not an organization that wants to take on a lot of debt or can take on a lot of debt. Um, so that was very important. Uh, for instance, I could give you another um, example. We did individual corporate donations. We just had a fundraising event a couple of weeks ago that raised over $50,000. That's big money to us. That is very important for our bottom line. Uh, capital equipment. Again, um, capital equipment is something that is difficult for us to be able to afford. We needed a Panorex at our school-based dental center, and which is a full view um, of children's mouths. Best quality of care to keep the kids at the, at the dental center instead of losing them when you have to send them up to the main facility. That cost $35,000. That took us a couple of years, but we got a private funder to pay for that, so now we have the Panorex. Those kinds of things are really important. We are a United Way recipient. Uh, so again, that's probably, that ranges depending on the year. It's been it's probably about 50,000, sometimes as much as 75,000, depending on the grant year. We also get community benefit money from Medical Center Hospital, um, from the UVM Medical Center. And right now, we get $100,000 in operating support that provides support to our sliding <laughs> fee scale, our medical sliding fee scale. And we also, I don't know if you're familiar with our Beacon Apartments uh, project, which we launched, again, another partnership with uh, Champlain Housing Trust and with uh, the hospital a few years ago. And this was 19 apartments that literally lifted the most medically vulnerable, chronically homeless folks off the streets of Burlington and put them into apartments. It's called Housing um, Housing First, or maybe you've heard or seen the video, um, Housing is Healthcare. I don't know if you remember that, but what was featured there was the Beacon Apartments, and we are the service provider for Beacon Apartments. Uh, that Beacon Apartments cost probably about $150,000 a year um, to provide on-site supportive uh, housing support to the clients, as you can imagine, who have many complicated issues and need hands-on support. Uh, and we are getting $100,000 a year to support that staffing at Beacon Apartments. So um, that community benefit money is really important to us. And so I think that just to, because just to, um, I do always like to get in a plug for innovation and um, 
what what I think the QHC brings in terms of uh, the community is that this is a well-developed safety net structure. It is highly regulated, and we represent the primary care access points all across the state. There's now 170 Vermonters. One of the highest percentages in the country receive their primary care from a federally qualified health center in Vermont. I think that that in and of itself demonstrates the need and uh, the need in different communities to be able to access care. I mean, if you think about the hospital, think about the hospital is literally half a mile away from the community health center, and we've grown to attract 30,000 patients over the years. And that is because of the welcoming aspect of the services that we provide. It's important when you're the boots on the ground to be able to provide that welcoming access. It is the, beds, the famous bedside manner of an FQHC. I guess is the way I would put that. So the other thing that I did want to say is that you know when we talk about finances, there is an, a, the old adage in the FQHC world: if you've seen one FQHC, well, you've seen one FQHC. Our finances, our services, how we look, is very, very reflective of the community that we serve. If you ask Sean Tester to come down here from Northern Counties, we will have the same model, the same structure, the same compliance accountabilities, and probably similar finances, but we would look different. Many of the details would be different. And I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, and I guess the final thing that I'd say is that I, I, I really do view us as the boots on the ground in the battle for healthcare reform and innovation and all the things that we are looking for um, for Vermonters. We're the ones that have the patients coming in. We are the ones that have the patients coming in and um, sitting in front of us. So I always think that that's important as well. But this is how we're keeping the doors open at the Community Health Centers of Burlington. I'm sure you have other questions. Okay, we'll open it up to questions from the board. Oh, George, did you want to say something? I'm not done. George is not done. <laughs> Um, the hybrid model. Then. The hybrid model. Yes. Um, so uh, just a couple of um, notes. Uh, the slides that you are not being projected do have a, a reference to the site visit protocol that Allison referenced. Um, I would have printed that out for you, but I think I would have killed many, many trees, so I chose to give you all a hyperlink to that. But that just goes to the accountability um, and regulatory requirements for an FQH state. Um, similarly, just a quick note about the uh, federal malpractice coverage that Allison referenced. While this is an amazing benefit for a health center, you actually have to apply to maintain that separate and apart from your regular FQHC application status. So there's a super special fund piece around maintaining that. Um, right, so moving on to the FQHC critical access hospital model. So this is a pretty unique hybrid. There are three of these in the country. We have two in Vermont, Gifford and Springfield. Um, and the final one is Mini Hamilton, Mini like the mouse, not petite, um, which is in West Virginia. Um, the one in West Virginia was created first, um, so we were not first out of the gate on this. Um, and the, the basic framework is that an FQHC serves as a parent to a critical access hospital. The re and it must be in that corporate structure because federal law around FQHCs requires that the FQHC board does not have anything governing it. So this consumer board that Allison referenced is in charge of the entire corporate entity in some way, shape, or form. Um, depending on which of the three of these um, hybrids you're looking at, there's either um, a merged corporate board over the entire structure, or you might have a hospital board in addition to the parent company board, um, and then there's some kind of complicated math and things like that. I won't bore you with those details. We can get there if you'd like. Um, so why would um, any entity, since there's only three of these, right, like what, what makes it attractive? Um, so the, the bottom line is that it, um, each of these organizations has uh, felt that they are able to address community needs more efficiently by having this hybrid model. Um, for Minnie Hamilton, the triggering event was that their local hospital closed. And so they were basically an hour and a half from any facility for services, and the community felt that wasn't good enough. Um, in Vermont, there is the extra layer of um, really being able to have a primary care focus and focusing on population health management and being able to commit more fully in health care reform initiatives for the state. 
options <coughs> that are meaningful for the two that are here. In general, um, each of the three said that the integration of services across the continuum of care, um, they're able to maximize the return on investment regardless of funder. Um, the reimbursement model, kind of this, this combination of what both Dave's talked about, uh, really works for the rural communities that they're in. Um, and there are some specific efficiencies. So there's you know, one C-suite, for example, and one HR department, um, where previously there were two um, organizations with all of those complexities. Um, some specific benefits that were identified are that um, there's some unique recruitment and retention opportunities. So there's um, a different level of attractiveness um, for some clinicians knowing that they're coming into this model. Um, there's some ability for streamlined community health planning and collaboration with their community. So kind of merging the community benefits that a, ho that a nonprofit hospital has to do with the mission of the FQHC. Um, maintaining hospital access in that rural community. Um, and also um, really being able to improve both the mental health and oral health service delivery. So those are not profit centers by any stretch of the imagination. So by combining this, um, these three institutions um, determined that they were able to really expand on those. Um, but there are some challenges. Um, there, uh, I guess, have eight masters, I know, many masters that they're serving from a regulatory perspective. Um, dual safety net designation is, is real work that they have to meet. So they're from an FQHC side meeting the HRSA obligations, from the critical access hospital, they're meeting the Medicare obligations, they're meeting your obligations on the hospital side. Um, and so there's, they kind of get the complexity of all of that. Um, but again, on the whole, the benefit has borne out for them and their boards. Um, the, another challenge is that there's a little bit of a shifting payer mix. So for an FQHC, the payer mix is, tends to be dominated by Medicaid and uninsured. That's kind of the bread and butter of why an FQHC is there. Um, and for clinical access hospital, it actually tends to be slightly more on the Medicare side. So there's some weird patient shifting that goes back and forth that just serves as an additional challenge. Um, because of the complexity of the regulatory oversight, there's um, some duplications and quality standards that you may be familiar with. Um, I won't go into detail there, but um, there's just a lot more reporting on that end as well as the financial end. Um, and then I think the final challenge that was noted is um, no one knows what they are as an entity. Are you a hospital? Are you a health center? Are you a clinical office? What are you doing? Um, so there's a lot of explaining what the heck they're doing to regulators, to patients, to folks they're recruiting in, um, and also the fact that they can't actually be everything to all people. So there's, um, the hybrid, again, has, um, I think, borne out to be successful for these three organizations, but as different, you know, hospitals or FQHCs would think about moving into it, um, it's, it's not for the faint of heart to get in there. Um, uh, despite the fact that actually HRSA, um, as the FQHC regulator, is trying to encourage more critical access hospitals to go in this trajectory because they find it beneficial from their oversight perspective. Um, so I will stop there. Um, and I'll uh, back to you, Chairman. Great. We'll open it up to questions from the board first. I just have a couple of quick ones. Um, <clears throat> the uh, part of the slide, there was a, a reference that um, the uh, cost uh, per patient uh, was 13% lower for Medicaid than um, Vermont Medicaid enrollees, and, and the footnote refers to a national study, and I just wasn't clear whether that 13% was a unique Vermont statistic or it was the national statistic. Yes, that's a, a unique Vermont statistic. It was a national study of eight states, one of which was Vermont. Oh, and Vermont was one of those. Yes. And the other is, uh, and I, I remember when I first met you, Georgia, that you talked about, we did talk a little bit about the uh, malpractice coverage, and it was, I remember the number, it was $400,000 in savings uh, that you told me way back when, it seems, you know, five months ago. But um, I'm just wondering, on the, on the other side of that, has that uh, malpractice insurance been utilized by you folks? Uh, yes. yes, it has. Um, yes. It, basically, if, if we get a malpractice suit or whatever, it, it goes to the courts, courts claim that we are a federal employee and then it goes to the federal courts claims for uh, settlement at that point in time. 
and that's it is a uh, coverage it's wonderful we don't have to pay around practice we do have wraparound for any services we may provide that are not an FQHC service thank you okay other questions Robin George you sort of alluded to one of my questions uh, but I'm going to ask it just to clarify it sounds like the three-year community health needs assessment that an FQHC do does is separate from the uh, community health needs assessment that a hospital nonprofit hospital would do uh, we're getting smarter about that um, Great. we do need to do um, we do um, for the past three years either I have or a health center staffer has been involved in the community health benefit program at the community health needs assessment program at the hospital and as a matter of fact we're going through that cycle again um, we do do something separate but we have used that to inform us and I think it makes far more sense for all of us to be working together and working off that same needs assessment. So that's a great question, and yes, we're getting much smarter about that. And do you think that's typical around the state, or do you think that's more unique to Chittenden County? Or if you don't know, that's fine too, of course. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It makes perfect sense. I would be surprised. Yeah. I think most of the FQHCs really do work closely with the hospital. Great. Um, and then my other question was, um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you calculate the encounter rate. I think that's based on a cost report, but I'm not positive about that. So I, if you could just talk a little bit. Sure. Look at that. Look at that. It is based on cost report. It's not the same cost report that the hospitals do. It's not as complex as the 224 form. Um, it is basically what we're doing is looking to split our costs between programs, the medical program, our dental program, and labs. Labs are paid on a fee-for-service or fee-scale basis rather than uh, part of the encounter rate. But then it's just uh, once we have the cost related to the medical and behavioral health, and it's just divided by our total number of encounters. Got it. Thank you. Okay, other questions? If not, at this time, we'll open it up to the public for any questions or comments. Dale. I just want to compliment the presentation. It sort of sounds like you're a group of artists that work in healthcare, and you're showing us what that creativity can do. But I don't know if you're all artists that just happen to work in healthcare. So, but I'm just. I'm trying to compliment that what you've done is that innovative. Beyond that, <coughs> if I try to think in terms of what have you given back to community for the investment the community gave you, what is your salary, but don't actually answer that. That's more just high level like, I know there's workforce issues that we face, but you didn't mention them, and yet you're doing some outstanding work from people that have to be really good. So, to, could you comment on that too, please? I, yeah, I, 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 yes, I would very much like to comment on that. I think that um, the health center is in a sweet spot in terms of recruitment and shipping training. Uh, as a matter of fact, sometimes I feel a little embarrassed when I talk about recruiting a Harvard-trained psychiatrist um, sitting next to Sean Tester at Northern Counties. And as a matter of fact, we're talking a little bit more about what we can do to be able to um, offer that um, some support to the other FQHCs. I think maybe you're asking in, in a way, do I pay competitively? Um, yes, but that's not why people, yes, but not quite. Close, but not quite. When you come to work for the health center, first of all, loan repayment and the fact that we can offer loan repayment is very important. I have yet to talk to a psychiatric nurse practitioner, psychiatrist, dentist, um, or family practice physician or inter internist that we recruit um, that is not very interested in that, and that is a very important part of it. Um, people come to work for the community health center and for FQHCs because of the work. Um, when you talked, it actually struck a chord with me when you talked about um, some sort of artistry because I will tell you that um, this yeah, sounds like a business. Healthcare sounds like a business, doesn't it? 
Well, I'm here to tell you that there is an art to it. Without developing things like trusting relationships, without developing things like bedside manner, without understanding um, the needs and wants of the person that's in front of you and to be able to provide a non-judgmental, uh, and these are all things that we don't talk very much about, but that is all part of what an MQHC brings to the table. So when I recruit a physician or I recruit someone, it's someone who wants to talk about the joy of practice. It's someone who gets excited about some of these programs. It's someone who gets really excited about saying, I can change something. I can do it quickly. I'm not in a system that's going to slow me down. And yes, we never quite seem to have enough money, but there is a camaraderie about it that I think is, um, it keeps people inspired and motivated to do the work. So I will tell you that it is kind of tough in terms of, you know, I just lost, a, I lost two nurses to the hospital. They paid $10 more an hour than what I can pay. And yet I pay RMs $3 more than some of the other FQHCs are able to pay. So it is a compl complicated recruitment environment, um, but I'm not going to complain because I think my fellow FQHCs in the different, in the rural environment probably have it far tougher than we do. Thank you. You're welcome. Father, yes, Ham. I'm curious, I wonder if you could ask the uh, um, Burlington people where they stand on the question of uh, whether they're going to participate in the all payer model, which is the centerpiece for reform here in the state, uh, shifting from, in the, uh, the engine really is to shift from fee for service reimbursement to capitated reimbursement and the uh, single biggest blocker to that, it seems to me right now, is the fact that several, FQ, many of the FQHCs, not all, are uh, staying out of that program. And I'm curious what Burlington's going to do. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to address that. It's him, right? <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, sure. Um, last year, uh, last year the health center actually considered very carefully whether to join one care. Um, I think I can, I can say that I was a very new CEO. We had just come on. Things were very tumultuous at the health center. I think that we were in a, um, we needed to be able to do some internal investments. I think we were looking at a, an ancient electronic medical record and some other things that were a little bit more uh, that we needed to attend to. Um, we certainly went through the entire process with One Care, but in the end decided that we really need, needed a year of internal investment and in getting things um, situated before we felt ready to be able to take on um, the work of One Care. Um, one thing I will say is that we are already around the table. If you look at the collaborative efforts that are being done in the Burlington area, um, as a matter of fact, we had staff people through the blueprint that actually started those collaborative efforts, uh, and we're, we're still at the table. We're not, I think, doing anything different in terms of the collaborative efforts, in terms of the actual care. Uh, I think for us it was really a practical issue. Um, this year, again, um, I've signed on the line to be able to look at our attributed lives. And for us, it's the decision whether to go in will be based on, will it make our care better? Are we going to be able to, do we have the staff in place? Do we have the systems in place to be able to do the work well? Because I think that's real, that is really important to us that we do the work well. Um, and really looking at it um, financially and the number of attributed lives. I will tell you that one of the problems that we faced last year was the number of attributed lives was quite different than the number of folks that we were caring for. And since we're going to have to provide those services um, to everyone who walks in the door, we're not going to be able to discriminate. I think that we needed to be able to have some time to think about how that would work. So the answer is we will absolutely consider it. Not quite the full answer you wanted, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> not a resounding yes, not a resounding no. Well, is, uh, can, one short follow-up. Sure. And considering uh, participation for the uh, uh, 2019 fiscal budget, 2019, you're not in any of the 17 or 18, I believe. No, we're not. How about 19? Yes, that's what I would, yes. I, I've asked for the modeling and I've, I've signed a participation to be able to take a look at what that looks like. And we fully intend to go through the process with one care to see where that leads us. 
What's the total dollars on the uh, community assessment that UVM funds? I'm sorry, you have to. You're receiving a, a revenue stream from UVM. The community benefit money? Yes. 200000 200 Yes, that's $100,000 so, for the medical sliding fee scale and $100,000 that helps subsidize the weekend. That's what was somewhat confusing to me because the bullets were at the same port, so I wasn't sure yeah, if no, they... No, we actually changed them, but we, I think we didn't, we didn't, it didn't quite make it in here. Yeah, okay. I Great. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I'd just like to ask a follow-up to the question about whether uh, the Community Health Center of Burlington was considering joining One Care, one of the, AC, the ACO model. Georgia, do you know if the uh, what's happening with the other FQHCs? Um, I know what's happening with one of them. Um, my understanding is, uh, if not all the majority of the FQHCs have, similar to Community Health Centers of Burlington, uh, signed the participation agreement to go through the exercise. Um, however, I would note that. Um, the majority of the FQHCs are really in close collaboration with their local hospitals. So to the extent that their hospitals are doing something or not doing something, um, those conversations are um, ongoing um, and as important as the conversations with one chair with all the other modeling. Okay, other questions? Walter. More of a rhetorical question, not a uh, specific one, but I, I like this presentation and I want to thank you for it, for some of the numbers here. I mean, I'm a healthcare activist and I hear a lot of numbers and one of the things is like the thousands of homeless people that come to, to these FQHCs and we struggle with trying to get health care for everyone. And I'm just curious what kind of a society we have here and for us to think about it if so many thousands of Vermonters are homeless and have to go into FQACs or places <laughs> like that. And the dental issue, you know, tens of thousands don't have dental care. And what is it that we're, tr that we're doing here where so many people are homeless? And I think it's something for us to think about when we deal with health care issues and all payer models and all that. The real problem, as you said, is that it's an art. I don't agree that health care is a business. I do agree that it's an art. Having been through health care as a business and barely survived it, it is a, it's not a business. It's more of an, you know, an art, bedside manner, take care, and it's always about the person that you're taking care of. And again, I just want us to think about those numbers that you quoted and thank for those numbers. Yeah, it's just more of a rhetorical question. So I, Alan, I guess I, I guess maybe I'll ask a rhetorical like, thank you for that comment, maybe my rhetorical question back for everyone else to think about is what do you think your community would look like without a federal qualified health So system? that too, you're right. I agree with you. <laughs> Okay, other questions or comments from the public? If not, I want to thank you for a great presentation. Thank you very much for having us. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll be back here um, well before the year is out to give him an even better answer to his question. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone.